Hello once again, wonderful people of YouTube land. It is your friend, once again, Wild Elf 26. Hey, I'm about to do a, a nighttime gaming rant and walk. So here we go. I'm not sure what to uh, kick the subject matter off, but I was thinking lately, I've seen some people talking about um, the retro gaming uh, new technology, such as uh, the analog products. Uh, one that's getting mentioned a lot now uh, because it's coming into larger production is the analog pocket. And it's definitely an option uh, to play your old uh, original vintage cartridges on the go uh, with different adapters provided it plays everything from Game Boy, Game Boy Color, Sega Game Gear, even Lynx. Uh, there's a, definitely an adapter for Lynx. But there's also adapters for NEC uh, card-based games, the card cartridges rather than the CD-ROM of course. But here's the thing, folks. As good as the analog uh, pocket machine is, it has an excessive price tag. And there are other options, of course. People have been talking about everything from something known as the Evercade, which there is a console version of the Evercade. Dedicated console version which features uh, two controllers and most of the cartridges, that's right, cartridges that plug into the Evercade uh, are legitimate. They're usually collections of various games. Oh, and forgive me if I intermittently say, uh, uh some videos I've noticed that I've fallen into that pattern of saying, uh, uh I guess it's usually about whatever my exhaustion or stress level is. So I'll tend to be using uh if I'm somewhat exhausted. Alrighty guys. But when it comes to the Evercade, it's usually collections of various titles from the same company that's been asked to do the cartridge. Usually around anywhere from 10 games to six, sometimes only three games on one cartridge. There's a Tomb Raider one that recently came out. Uh, it looks pretty well. It's basically the PlayStation and PC versions of Tomb Raider with different uh, controller options. But then uh, what we're talking about too is the handheld version, the handheld version of the Evercade as a more uh, financially viable option to the analog pocket. Plus, I believe the Evercade is in more abundance as far as availability than the analog pocket competitor. Uh, you may go online now and put that test, put that theory to the test. Uh, but I believe uh, a, su a sufficient number of games have been made for the Evercade and it will warrant uh, gamer interest. It seems to have the ability to play games from PS1 generation and before as far as CPU power behind it. So the older games on some collections of course they'll work flawlessly but the fact that the CD-ROM based games that were on PS1 are also working flawlessly now it does have to go in and access the game just like your original uh, PlayStation hardware had to do off the disc. And I've seen some people that have posted uh, YouTube reviews of it complaining about the loading time. Well, if they're truly dedicated to retro gaming, then they're aware that those load times exist and what they should be doing is comparing the load times 
of the Evercade version, the Evercade collection version, to the actual hardware version. Now, if the Evercade version takes longer to load, then they have a legitimate reason to gripe. But if the Evercade version is about the same or less load time, then they really kind of need to shut up about it, you know? It's basically giving you the retro game experience, which is what the Evercade promises. I don't have any agreements with Evercade or any, any deals. I, I haven't been able to uh, acquire one or do a product review of one. They definitely have not approached or provided me with one, so... Uh, I'm hoping that there's a decent fighting game collection of some sort for the Evercade. And I'm not talking about uh, Final Fight style games. I'm talking about, you know, Street Fighter, Samurai Showdown, those type of fighting games. Mortal Kombat, of course. I don't know if uh, the Evercade handlers will uh, approach WB games or... Uh, the current owners of SNK to uh, have a Evercade version of those particular collections. Uh, I hope they do. I hope they're. I hope they've got the confidence to do that because they've accomplished a lot in a short period of time with the Evercade. I'm more impressed by what I see with the Evercade than Mr. FPGA, uh, any analog product. That, that claims they're going to do anything with the CD-ROM contents. And so far, the only thing they've done for CD-ROM support with analog has been uh, a Genesis replication that works with Sega CD. And it's actually pretty good, but for the kind of prices that analog throws around for their products, I'm not convinced that people actually need it. Uh, as far as the analog Genesis goes, their competitor, the Retron or Mega Retron HD, uh, it actually plays virtual racing. That's something that even actual Sega Genesis units had a hard time doing. When it came to uh, the Sega Genesis 3 unit, most of those could not even play virtual racing. And the problem with that is you're buying something that claims to be a genuine product and you're using actual company brand software and it's completely incompatible and you paid some good money for it. And back in the day this wasn't as much of a hassle because the prices were low. But now everything's vintage and every time they put the vintage label or the nostalgia label on it, suddenly its collector price goes through the damn roof for no apparent reason. Uh, which is really uh, a fallacy because a lot of this stuff was produced in ample supply. There's literally millions of copies of some of this stuff. And they act like there was only 400 of them produced or something, so they're going to charge $300 for a loose cart that, that doesn't even look good. And you probably have to clean it off before you use it in your machine anyway. And you have to hope that they haven't dump loaded uh, the file off of it, you know, 20 or 30 times. Because the more something rips a cartridge, the more the ROM file on it gets degraded. And people don't seem to understand uh, that process. Anytime you're using a clone system, you either have... Uh, system on a chip, which is good, it reads the cartridges like an actual system does. But if you have a ripper, and usually the the uh, signs that something is a ripper is if it offers any kind of language patches or allows you to do any ROM hack patches within the machine. If it allows you to do that, then it's not it's not affecting the actual cartridge it's ripping the ROM off and it's adding the uh, patch file to the ROM. So basically every time it runs that game, it's copying that game, copying the ROM. 
and then it's adding the translation patches that it's bragging so much about having to be able to do. And uh, one of them that's notorious for this is the Retron 5. It's a definite ROM ripper. There's also the At Games, uh, HD At Games Genesis. It too talks about uh, language patches. And so what it's doing is it's basically ripping every Genesis game you put in it. Uh, thankfully, it does have a large assortment of Genesis games already in it. ROMs are already provided. But because it does have that function of playing cartridges too, your vintage cartridges, the ones that mean a lot to you sentimentally, as well as their value, which is now quite high in some cases, and you're trying to replace uh, one of these vintage items and you cannot replace that cheaply. You got things that have three uh, three digit figures on something that realistically should only be worth two digits. Uh, games that are probably worth around 80 bucks uh, are being shoved upon us to be worth nearly 300 bucks. In some cases, it's not even really good games. And uh, the, the litmus test for not really good games. And being a retro gaming elf, I will let you know what others are afraid to talk about. Uh, yeah, we all like different kinds of genres of games. Yeah, that's, that's not a mystery. There's, you know, nobody's unclear on that. Uh, however, when a game does not do well in sales, when a game basically, for the most part, financially is a flop, then I have to tell you, it's, it's not like a movie. This means people played this game, people back in the day rated this game, and based on ratings in magazines and whatnot, people did not pursue this game. That's why the sales were so dismal. Um, games that are overinflated now that really weren't worth messing with. And one of them, the big one, is uh, Earthbound for the SNES. They make a huge deal about that game. But a lot of magazines do not really praise it very high. Uh, I know a lot of people back in the day that rent different games from Blockbuster first before they buy them or some mom and pop shop that did what Blockbuster did. Yeah. They might have messed with Earthbound just a little bit and they weren't interested. They just brought it back. But for some reason, the value of Earthbound has gone through the roof. I think it mostly has something to do with the SNES version, including a manual. So the box was a different size than the average SNES boxes because of the special multi-page manual that was more than what you normally get with a regular SNES game. And in a way you can think of it as a collector box because of it being a, a different size, you know, a different shape. But that's simply not always the case. And if you love Earthbound, you know, well, that's great. You know, more power to you. But basically, it's a video game for a very popular console system at the time. And the sales were just not there for it. It sold marginally. Um, there are games that, that were more popular, but I don't see staggering values on, like, the original Clay Fighter. The, the value on that one's okay, but then the the one that was made for uh, the sequel that was later made for uh, Clay Fire, uh, was it a, a 63 and a third or something? It was made for the N64. And that game goes for ridiculous money. And it's a game, I talked to other uh, N64 aficionados. Uh, eventually I'll be getting some sort of N64 again at some point. 
uh, whether it be clone, whether it be some perhaps a unique handheld, who knows. Um, but some of the N64 aficionados I know of in my region, which is the lower uh, southern United States, I'm down here in central Florida, um, they hardly, you mentioned Clay Fighter on the N64, and they're like, what? Yeah, they, they didn't even know about it. Uh, so it must have had marginal advertisement, probably none. Which kind of reminds me of the fate of the Sega Nomad. Uh, except for a few magazine photograph ads, which were not very widely uh, distributed, to tell you the truth. Uh, there was no television commercials. There was hardly any support from Sega at all for a brand new machine they just put out. Yeah. It's like, gee guys, don't you care a little? You're launching a, a console, a handheld version of one of your flagship regimes, and they they don't even want to give it commercials. Not not in the United States. Yeah. Um, for those that don't know, the Sega Nomad was a 16-bit handheld, a true 16-bit handheld, not like that Neo Geo Pocket Color thing. Uh, Neo Geo Pocket Color is like a Game Boy Color with slightly ramped up CPU, but the graphics still look like something that the Game Boy Color could probably produce under the right supervision. But uh, the Nomad was a true 16-bit, and it played your full-size Genesis cartridges. It had a built-in integrated six-button controller, and underneath it, it had an input for, get this, Player 2! Yeah, it was a handheld, and Player 2 could just plug a controller in and join you in the fun. Just sitting in the back of a bus, or in the back seat of your friend's SUV or something, or if you're on a subway train or something, you and whoever could enjoy some Street Fighter or whatever cartridge you put in that thing. I mean, it, it was wacky. Wacky and wonderful. Some some say the Switch is the modern day interpretation of like a Nomad. And the Switch has a lot of very interesting uh, features and capabilities to it. And and there are some things about the Switch that I that I review and look at and um, some of my friends have Switch and they're always bragging about different things about Switch. But when it comes down to it, uh, unlike the Switch, when you put a Sega Genesis game in a Nomad, it's an entire game right on the cartridge. Uh, the Switch has cards. They're little cartridges, but they're little cards, basically uh, customized SD cards as cartridges. But they have a memory level limit. And some of the games require Wi-Fi confirmation so it can load the rest of the game onto the internal memory card, which is usually whatever terabyte or, or really high gigabyte uh, memory card you put in there. And that's kind of sad, you know, because that means that some of these games will have re replay value some of these games will have resell value or retrade value but other ones after the switch servers are no more at some point um, they'll basically be incomplete cartridges that have no uh, re retrade value whatsoever because uh, it's like half a game and I always felt like that was kind of like a ripoff, like a scam of some sort, you know? I don't know, you guys can let me know in the comments if if you think only half a game only on a cartridge is perhaps kind of a ripoff. Seems a little odd to me, because it's a dedicated gaming system.
yes it has a portable aspect which is kind of its primary focus but it docks it hooks up to your fancy HDMI television um, it has different controller options uh, there's even the switch light and there's uh, different versions uh, of attachments that allow you to do basically the same things you can do with the regular switch only the switch light has uh, integrated controllers that can't be slid out whether that's a good or bad thing well that's up to you in the comments <laughs> uh, tell me if, if you have the switch light and you prefer it with its built-in only controllers or tell me if you have the OLED switch and you prefer it over a switch light or something. Uh, I'm, I'm eager to see your comments. Uh, tell, tell me what's good about it, you know? What I do like is that Nintendo... Nintendo finally smartened up and uh, they actually... They actually added some, some game grips for the Switch that have a dedicated D-pad. Uh, one of the early ones is a Legend of Zelda one featuring Link wearing his green cap and a green tunic. Uh, you know, proper Link. Not this weird blue clothes, no cap wearing Link. Um, and that brings us down a different rabbit hole I'll talk about in a minute. But, uh, yeah, so the Switch, you know, I consider it, it's, it's officially a handheld, but it's also a console. But it's not trying to compete with uh, Xbox, whatever it is this week, and uh, PlayStation 5. It's, it's not trying to wow you with the greatest graphics in the world. You know, oh yeah, yeah, we, we made a machine that's uh, capable of the greatest graphics in the world. Yeah, but uh, we don't have any original games for it. No, no, no. You see, uh, apparently we've overcomplicated the uh, game-making process the more we up the graphics level. And now it requires us to have a, a team of 300 people and a, a six-month time window just to make one follow-up game to a popular franchise. Yeah, okay. Uh, th welcome to modern gaming, apparently. Or this is what the status quo has fallen to for modern gaming. Why does a, a follow-up game for a Sony machine or a Xbox machine require a dev team of over 300 people and a six or seven month window just to complete the game? And most of the time, as with the new DLC consoles when they started, it seems to be this thing where they put the game out probably three months before they should and then they charge you. They have the unmitigated gall to charge the person extra money for a microtransaction so they can download content that was supposed to be included in the game before they released it. I will reiterate that point in case that's not clear. What they're basically doing is they're making an incomplete game and they are selling it at full retail price. Oh, and of course, for a lot of the modern gamers, some of which don't know this and some of which do, uh, they do not include a instruction booklet. No, no, no. They want you to download and print your own. So you're getting charged all this money, plus you don't get an instruction booklet. Not, not a proper one available for you when you open the box. No, no, they want you to do additional build and assembly work for them. While they enjoy counting your money. Uh, to me, that, that always kind of grinded my gears, you know. The flame that burns my ass, yeah. Um, you pay that kind of money, you better get a nice instruction manual. And if it goes greatest hits, then it should be a black and white instruction manual. You know, without the color. Um, that worked in the older 
generation days and they had a sufficient dev team cost and practically all the problems they got today only the windows to make the games were a lot shorter but the prices were around the same although they're starting to take uh, they're starting to take a mile on the pricing of games too so this is uh, hurting modern gaming Nintendo was wise. Nintendo stuck to their switch. They, they saw what the other companies were doing and they thought, let's go in a slightly different direction. And with that decision, I will applaud Nintendo. That was a wise decision. They were going for innovations in uh, use of gaming rather than this constant, and I apologize for any vul vulgarness, um, but they were, they were going for innovation of actual game implementation rather than these big name companies, Xbox and Sony, uh, Microsoft and Sony, basically doing a giant pissing contest. Yes, friends, that's what I equate it to. It's a giant pissing contest. It's like a giant show of macho-ness about what their product can do. Only it takes them, you know, forever and a day to get one game out. Especially if it's first party game. Oh, it seems to take forever. Um, now, unfortunately, there are companies that produce games for these machines that have hit hard times. Or, let's be more honest, uh, they've had very bad leadership within their companies, made all levels of horrible, horrible decisions. Um, example, there's a company, a really good company, really established, uh, Konami. And Konami has been awesome for a lot of games, you know. There wouldn't be a Silent Hill without Konami, you know? Um, there wouldn't be Ninja Turtles the arcade game and the follow-up Turtles in Time without Konami. Konami did these wonderful things. And the uh, Ninja Turtles games based off the 2000, uh, what was it, 2003 Turtles uh, animated series? Konami is responsible for all that. And each one of these is awesome. You know, and some people are huge fans of Konami's uh, Castlevania series, you know. But one of their most prolific game makers, one of the people almost single-handedly responsible for putting Konami really on the map of stars when it comes to the gaming world, uh, was Hideo Kojima. And uh, Hideo Kojima... He's like a rock star of gaming. And Metal Gear Solid, I'll just say it, Metal Gear Solid, you know? Uh, if there's one game franchise that made Konami truckloads of money, it was Metal Gear Solid. And it's different iterations over the years. From its original inceptions on the uh, uh, NES to the, the wonderful games we got on the PS1 to the many revisions we got throughout the PS2 and PS3 uh, and, and the GameCube remake of the first one, uh, the Twin Snakes on the GameCube. If you own a GameCube or a Wii or even Dolphin emulator or whatever, uh, I recommend Metal Gear Solid, the Twin Snakes. That is awesome, especially if you are a hardcore fan of the PS1 original. And uh, I'm an OG for the PS1. I'll give you an idea of how far back I go gaming. Um, I enjoyed playing uh, the very first Ninja Turtles game on the NES when it came out new. Um, so that gives you some idea right there. But that's as far as I go back nostalgia. Um, 
we had at times uh, Atari 2600 had played games like Super Breakout, Pitfall, um, the Atari 2600 version of Pac-Man, and uh, <clears throat> the NES system when it came out, it just blew it all out of the water. And uh, e even in those days, you know, I, I compared the NES compared to the Atari 2600, and I, I, I do have sentimentality about certain things of the past, but in that moment when I played only probably six NES games, the, the year of its American uh, debut, and it was on a friend's NES, I, I didn't own one at that time, uh, let me make that clear. They were kind of pricey when they came out over here. And uh, contrary to what a lot of people believe in certain areas of the world, you know, uh, America has a lot of opportunities, especially in the 80s. You could really get a lot done if you were of adult age and you had stamina about you, a healthy body, and a, a good mind on you. But the streets were not paved with gold, you know. Everybody was not rich and wealthy. Um, and aside from uh, the NES, uh, you know, the, the personal internet thing really didn't exist here, you know, unless it was people that had a corporate job or something or some kind of office job where they, they had an excuse for the exorbitant cost of certain home computers of the day, which there were not a great many of. And uh, the way it's perceived or the way it's the way it's uh, kind of spread out there in the lexicon of pop culture, they make it sound like every other house on the block had a, a Apple II, you know, or, or someone's office had a bunch of IBM computers or something. Uh, and that just simply wasn't the case. You know, these things were massively expensive. And the places that usually had them, them were quite well off. Now, there were some places where people could actually make payments gradually. And they might have one of these things in their home. But they didn't own it. And they were very strict about who touched it, who got to use it, you know. And uh, you, you can definitely... Uh, be fully understanding of why they're so strict about it, you know. Uh, something super expensive that they're making payments on, you know. I mean, heck, even VCRs during the time of the NES launch were not exactly cheap. And um, that was a video format that, that, you know, most of them were VHS that I encountered back in those days. Um, it was a video format that was a mainstay, and there was mom and pop video rentals before Blockbuster came along. Um, but the players themselves were pretty expensive. One of the key points of Blockbuster when it finally uh, opened up around the country was that not only could you rent movies there, but they would also rent you the VCRs themselves. And uh, that's pretty nice, you know. That continued later when the DVDs came. They would actually rent out some DVD players once in a while uh, for the new video format. I'm sorry, guys. I know it's a, a walk and rant, a gaming walk and rant. Uh, it's gone on longer than I had intended, I guess. And I haven't even touched on a couple of the subjects I wanted to go down. But basically, modern gaming, the big companies give us a lot of, a lot of excuses and very few new games. And uh, as far as the PS5 goes, it seems like a lot of their library is made up of uh, re-enhanced, already existing PS4 titles. And some games that they claim to be new, but the graphics on them, the structure, certain sounds on them, 
look basically like they're a continuation of like an expansion pack to a previous P PS4 video game that they just repackaged and put it out there and claim it's a brand new PS5 game. And uh, I'd say that that's also the case for some of the higher uh, generation Xbox games. But because I don't mess with Xbox, uh, I don't even know what the current Xbox console is called, mainly because I really don't give a crap. And um, like I said, my channel's about retro gaming, but I do try to be open-minded, believe it or not. But what I see more and more when it comes to modern gaming, as much as I stand back and try to give this game or that game a chance, it just seems like you know, more and more appalling things are quite noticeable. And here's the thing, folks. I embrace gamers of all uh, generations, you know. Uh, my channel is for people, uh, I, I target 20 and up. That's, that's my audience, what, what I intend for my audience. If anyone has a question about that, well, I just answered it. 20 years old and up. But if there's younger folks or whatever, coming into the channel, you know, or coming into these discussions, these chat room discussions. Um, I'm willing to hear you out on a certain game to, to an extent, you know, within respect. Um, I'm not crapping on people's generation. I'm just saying that the game companies were playing a lot more fair, a lot more like they sort of actually cared about us with the earlier generation stuff. Now we come to the modern generation and they're being very blatant about how they actually do not care about gamers. They're, they're being so blasé. They're not even trying to hide their, their unending greed that they have. Uh, thankfully, Nintendo is actually still trying to entertain you with their games. Whereas Sony and Xbox just seem to try to want to impress you with what the game looks like rather than what its content is. And we're getting a lot of, and I hate to say it because there are some good voice actors out there, but it comes down to the scripts being written for these wonderful voice actors. And they can only work with the script as it's given to them. And in a lot of these newer games, I know how some people think they're getting this epic amount of voice acting, these scenes that are uh, full of, uh, what's the term they like to use now? Feels. Oh man, that game's got a lot of feels. Yeah. yeah, well, you know, I'm sure there is a lot of emotional content or whatever, but some of these games are so overhammed about it, or they, they play out a moment, you know, uh, stretch out moments so long that any real emphasis or, or impact of the moment is gone. They, they made the moment boring, you know. Uh, I was blown away years ago by the uh, GameCube remake of Resident Evil 1. Although I was hoping you could unlock a mode where it would give you the cheesy dialogue from the first game when you play through it a, a third or fourth time, but they didn't do that. They should have. It would have been hilarious. But it was done well. The characters looked right. Uh, the relationships were respectable and to the source material. And there wasn't a bunch of unnecessary stuff between the characters. Um, I find it ironic that the 3D models for GameCube Resident Evil Remake look as good, if not better, than the 3D models for Resident Evil 2 Remake, 17 years later. Uh, you can do the comparisons yourself. There's plenty of videos online. If you happen to be lucky enough to have both the GameCube Remake of RE1, as well as, uh, let's say, the PS4 uh, RE2 Remake, you can do comparisons yourself uh, for how well the the character polygons are on the usable character itself. How detailed, how the light hits them, how, how 
the shades and skin tone and all that looks. Uh, body movement, body animation. Um, like I said, I just wasn't impressed by it. And I felt they had altered so much on Resident Evil 2 Remake. Uh, and I'm saying I, I just wasn't impressed by RE2 Remake. Uh, because it was done by a company that looked like they were given a list of stuff that they had to check off a list that had to be in the game. And then given all this room to just make it theirs, make it their own. And the problem is they made a disrespectful product. Uh, Claire was strong. She wasn't an uncertain, you know, needed to hold her hand at all times, weak woman stereotype. But here, in this culture that acts like it's all crazy about woke and, and women uh, powerment thing, um, they went out of their way. This company that did the remake of Resident Evil 2 went out of their way to make this new Claire, which they give different clothing to, which was right away uh, a disrespectful thing. There was no reason to give her uh, such different clothing. Uh, her motorcycle outfit with the knife holster and everything, that was a big part of who she was. Uh, it was what she had learned from her brother Chris. Uh, he had been given her training. And uh, she had mentioned stuff about this to Leon in the previous OG games. But they seem to disregard all that in the Resident Evil 2 remake. And it's like, why would they do that, you know? Why would they do that? Oh well, guys. But here's the thing, too, and I have to say this. I cannot emphasize this enough. And this is what makes this a gamer rant, a gaming rant and walk. If you play the remake of RE2, RE4, RE3, if you're playing the remakes and then you're playing the OG ones, well, your opinion if that's your first exposure to it, is the remakes, then your opinion of the OG ones means absolutely squat, means nothing. You know why your opinion means absolutely squat, means nothing? Because the OG ones are canon. That was what it was supposed to be, what it started as. Those are, are, are the sacred voice actors, the sacred uh, movements, the sacred locations that were supposed to be in the game. But if your only exposure is the remakes and then you go back and start talking or want to do a video about some comparison when you've done the remakes only, that was your first one only, and now you're going to look at the old ones, uh, there's always this position of complete disrespect. I hate to admit it, but yeah, one of the old ones will have tank controls. Why? Because that's what Resident Evil was intended to have. We had first-person shooters. Heck, we even had third-person games. Uh, perhaps people forgot about uh, a Bruce Willis game called The One. Yeah, that was on PS1. That was a, a from-behind third-person shooter. Uh, and we had Power Slave and Quake and Quake 2 and other first-person shooters at PS1 generation level. Um, Resident Evil 2, 3, 4 was not supposed to be that. Well, th 4 was. 4 was the over-the-shoulder one. The first over-the-shoulder one. And that didn't pop out till like 2004 on the GameCube. But these remakes are all re-envisioned to have a Resident Evil 4 camera angle. And then at one point, they got Heidi Tidy uh, uh, Super Elitus, and they decide, you know, oh, well, Resident Evil 4, being the classic and uh, trendsetter it was, it's not good enough. No, no, we got to remake the super classic that, that was a, a groundbreaker all on its own. And then they showed their disrespect on how they did Ada Wong, how they did, even Saddler. Saddler, they just wanted to make him look more scary or weird or something. A lot of the, the, the humanity in, in Saddler is just not present. 
Um, they, they made him more menacing. He wasn't even that menacing. Sure, he was the leader. He knew he was going to take over using the, the, what do you call those things, the symbiotes or, or parasites. That's what they are, parasites. Um, but he had a sense of humor about it, too. Like when he was telling Leon he wanted to introduce him to it. And then Leon says something about, oh, you can't remember the name? A senior moment, perhaps. You know, Sadler has a nice little laugh about it. And you can see it actually was humorous to Saturn. There's facial expressions in the original Resident Evil 4. Um, but it's just not there in the remakes. It's, there, there's a quality to it, unless you played the first four first and then played the remake. You just won't get the quality element that you actually are missing in the remake. Because you've been dazzled. You've been, you've been distracted by these wonderful new graphics. And then they throw in a few extra verses of dialogue here and there. And then, you know, that's not cool enough. So what else? Oh, we're going to throw in a bunch of potty mouth uh, bad words here and there. Anytime they can't open a door or something else... You know, we're just going to generically have them swear or act like they're pissed off or something. Oop, pardon me, another vulgarity. I don't usually do those, but this is a gaming walk and rant. Alrighty. Uh, this walk is almost over. Uh, that's why I'm stopping here for a moment. But I just want to make sure you guys know that when it comes to the remakes of Resident Evil... <clears throat> If you haven't played the OG's titles first, and you're, you're only going to do a comparison based on your knowledge only of having played the remakes, then you might as well not even do the comparison because it makes you prejudice against them. It makes you nonchalant. There's another word for it. It makes you glib toward the OG's. And that's just sad, but that's the fact. It, it, I can't redo the human brain. That's how the human brain works, you know? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, oh, the other rabbit hole, yeah. If I can do it kind of quick here. Uh, I'm a huge Zelda fan, and in the majority of my YouTube videos, I am dressed as Link from the NES version of Legend of Zelda 2. Uh, majority of the time. Uh, when, when I can do it, when the weather's not too inclement for it, you know. I try to do that as much as possible. And uh, that, that is the personification of Wild Elf 26. In case anybody does not know that yet, that's who that is. It's Link from the second NES Zelda game. Uh, that was a side view for the most part. And a little bit of overview, but it was mostly side view. Um, and if you look at the artwork for the instruction manual for the second Zelda game, uh, that costume is pretty much spot on. All right, guys. Um, now, what I'm going down with the rabbit hole here is we were touching on the different Zelda games. And... Uh, Different people have their interpretations of what they believe is Zelda canon. The problem is, and it's not just a Zelda problem, it's a problem with other franchises too. There seems to be just a plain number, too many reboots. Too many reboots, people. For example, the original Zelda trilogy, and this is how I interpret it, based on the gaming content and how Link interacts with the different characters and what he has said that's revealing. <clears throat> Zelda 1 and Zelda 2, of course, those are chrono chronologically proper. Uh, but there's some uh, bickering, some brick and brack about uh, Zelda 3. Now, to me, the actual Zelda 3 that completes the Zelda trilogy in chronological order is the Game Boy Zelda. That is Zelda 3. Whether people argue with that or not, I really don't care. 
It's based on how he interacts with the people, how he looks, how he looks in the instruction booklet artwork, how he looks in the actual game, and what the story has him doing at that point, um, where he has advanced to by that point. <clears throat> Example, in uh, the Game Boy uh, Zelda, which is Link's Awakening, he is uh, shipwrecked on some island he knows nothing about. He wakes up in a house with a, a mustached guy and uh, his daughter. And his daughter's name, I, I think it was Marin. And she looks a lot like Zelda. Very strongly. And he, at first, when he wakes up, he calls her Zelda a couple times. And uh, she says, no, no, my name's Marin. And they found him, and they brought him there. And uh, her dad uh, gives him his shield, which washed up with him. And he said that other things from his boat were washing up on shore, but it activated a bunch of monsters that suddenly were active in the area ever since he washed up. Perhaps these monsters were actually searching for him and found him on the island. I don't know. But he has knowledge of Zelda. He has a shield. He has a sword. He, he has the training. He has gone through adventures before. So Zelda 1, 2, and Game Boy, chronologically, everything sounds proper. Here's, here's, my, my, here's what burns my ass, what, what grinds my gears, and I, I cannot emphasize it enough, is the SNES, the utter disappointment of the SNES Zelda Link to the Past. Link to the Past is like a soft reboot. He's kind of a kid again. <clears throat> he starts off in his uncle's house. He never had a sword. He doesn't have shields or nothing. And uh, his, his uncle goes off to save Zelda in a rainstorm. He tells him to stay in the house, stay protected. But he keeps hearing Princess Zelda, and he doesn't know her. He doesn't have any knowledge of her. He just hears, him, hears her through his mind or something. And he goes off looking for her, and he finds a secret garden entrance to the underground catacombs. And uh, he finds his uncle mortally wounded and, and still alive, but, but starting to die off. And his uncle hands him his sword and tells him it's important that he saves Zelda. And during the course of this conversation, he tells, her, tells, him, tells Link that, that Zelda is his, and he dies. And he doesn't finish it. And it's that way in the Japanese version, too. He tells him, Zelda is your... And we never find out. But he has no knowledge of Zelda. He never met her before. He hasn't seen her face-to-face until -face he finds her in that dungeon. So this tells us that Link to the Past, which is even worse because they redesigned Link, uh, he has bright pink hair. Can never forgive that, Nintendo. I don't care what you do. Can't forgive that. Unless you release the game again with him not having pink hair and not having a yellow belt. All right, guys. Uh, I've yammered on for a good chunk of time now. This has been a proper uh, gaming or retro gaming walk and rant. And this is your good pal, Wild Elf 26 This was at nighttime, folks. And uh, just to reiterate, <clears throat> Zelda Link to the Past. And you can make comments down below. Please do. Uh, as long as they're not vulgar, they'll remain. Link to the Past is not a sequel to the NES games. It is a reboot. It's a reboot that Nintendo didn't even like. Even though they tried to make money off of it, they didn't like it. Because when the N64 came along... They rebooted it again, only they made an excellent game, and it spawned a sequel, Majora's Mask, um, where we were actually getting sequels to a game again until they pulled that surprise on us with the GameCube version, um, that Wind Waker thing. 
another reboot. So I, I don't like the reboots. The reboots are bad. Give us proper sequels that continue the story. Please, game companies, stop doing the reboots unless it's something that the fans are just begging for. Which, surprising enough, in those reboot cases, the fans were not begging for reboots. They just wanted follow-ups. They wanted sequels, folks. Okay. And if you feel the way that I feel about that, then please let me know that also in the comments. All right, guys. Uh, this is Wild Elf 26. I'm a big Zelda fan. I'm a Nintendo fan. But I am not a fan boy. Those are fanatics. They will buy anything the company makes for that franchise. And no matter what kind of steaming, horrible pile of crap it really is, they'll just praise it no matter what. And they'll immediately attack anybody that says anything bad about it. <laughs> so I'm a fan, not a fanboy. And that is the difference between a fan and a fanboy. A fan knows when they're getting crap and doesn't like it and says something about it. A fanboy just says, oh yes, it's the greatest thing ever, no matter what it is. Fresh diarrhea on their plate, oh, it's the greatest thing ever. Okay. Fan Fanboys are fanatics but not in a good way. All right, guys, have a great one. It's Wild Elf 26. If I had my ocarina handy, I'd play you out. All right, bye-bye. Have a good one. Be good to each other. Help some folks if you can. These times are tough. Be safe, folks. Bye-bye.